Resident Evil, the so-called pinnacle of survival horror, the game that started a phenomenon and inspired countless other titles throughout the years. It's a beloved gaming franchise I never had the chance to delve into. I played through 4 in a noisy household where I couldn't focus on it, and Resident Evil 7 during a very anxious time of my life, which also left me struggling to focus. I think I enjoyed each one, but now that I'm much more settled in life, I want to revisit the franchise from the beginning, examining if it holds up in a modern light. To do so, I bought the 2002 remake of the first game on my PlayStation 4, reading that it's a pretty faithful recreation of the original experience. This video and its follow-up will spoil the entire game as I break down my thoughts across Jill's campaign. Another video will come shortly afterward where I analyze Chris's side of things. So let's get into it. I started my first playthrough on normal difficulty. At this time, I didn't know anything about the difference in characters, storyline, or even how the game controlled. I wanted to go in as blind as possible, like I would have as an innocent young lad without much internet access, as I was at the game's release. Resident Evil's intro cutscene is decidedly dramatic, hinting at some strange beings attacking and eating people. As a member of the Stars Police Force, it's up to Jill to go on and check it out, as the previous squad went MIA trying to do so. Upon landing, Jill and her squad are immediately attacked by zombie dogs, and this toolbox here is apparently the the only one who can hit them. We ran away, of course. Wouldn't you if Chris this way. was your line of defense? Everyone takes refuge inside a conveniently placed mansion that isn't quite your ordinary house. That's for sure. Chris is missing, a bang is heard, and for some reason we separate to figure it out. Already, the game is hilariously cheesy and I love it. I haven't even touched the controller and Resident Evil has established a ridiculous world. Like, look at this clown. But we've got to find- What was that? Chris? No. Jill, go and investigate. I'm going with her. <clears throat> A dining room. I slowly move around the long dining room table to try and get used to these tank controls. We find some blood on the ground and I head off on my own as Barry needs to examine the blood for some reason. See if you can find any other clues. I'll be examining this. The game gets right into things in the next room where a zombie is eating a former squad mate. This is shown in a disgusting cutscene before it cuts back to Jill in a moment's notice. Considering that I'm not even used to the controls yet, I struggle to sprint down the hallway and gun down the zombie from a distance. This MF takes eight bullets before falling down and then has the audacity to get back up. I try stabbing him a couple of times to save ammo, he falls down but gets back up again and kills me in the process. Less than five minutes of gameplay and I'm already dead. This game couldn't give less of a crap about me and this is just the normal difficulty. But that's also a refreshing take. As the so-called pinnacle of survival horror, Resident Evil presents itself as just that. Contrary to most modern games, there's no tutorial. Hints and instructions are peppered throughout optional, easily missed documents. The game assists you at times, but mostly leaves you to your own devices. Even the difficulty levels are open to interpretation at first. I start the game again and head the other way down the hallway instead of face first into hell, but these doors are locked. The game funnels you into this scenario, so this time I just gun him down, only to find a videotape near the body. Another zombie appears out of nowhere when I report back to Barry. Wesker disappears, Wesker! and Barry suggests we split up. I don't know why everyone wants to split up already, it really seems like a terrible idea, but I guess being alone does put the horror in survival horror. Left on my own, exploring the mansion is absolutely terrifying. The game's static camera angles are unlike any modern horror games I've played. Titles like Outlast, Alien Isolation, Blair Witch, and even Resident Evil 7 are in first person. Having scares right in your face is a form of horror in its own right, but this game takes the camera control completely out of my hands. 
This is a tactic later replicated in games like Until Dawn, but that's a different take on it considering that's an adventure title without traditional combat. My control in that game is in the story choices, but it goes to show just how influential Resident Evil really was. This design choice combined with the mansion's linearity provide a controlled environment where Capcom can choose how it wants to scare me, though I'm given agency with weapons and movement. It's a tough balancing act, but one that's mostly handled with grace. I spend the next hour or so acclimating myself at the mansion, collecting things and double tapping dead bodies while adjusting to these tank controls. I do my best not to waste ammo, but this knife does nothing, man. I gotta shoot these guys. After some more exploring, I come across a death trap that activates when I take a key. There's no way around this without putting the key back, so I make a mental note to return here later. In my search for items, I come across a statue with a blue gem on it. I push it off a balcony and recover the gem while getting hurt in the process. Wounded, I search for healing items and cheese a zombie to death in the process. Along the way, I find a map of the area hidden on top of a statue. This stuff is awesome. Finding a map and slowly discovering my way around instead of being given the entire space ahead of time is a great way to reward the player for exploration. I also appreciate how Resident Evil's map tells me if I haven't 100%ed an area yet. It throws me a bone without giving away too much information, which keeps the game challenging as I have to fight my way back to these rooms and discover what's up. Anyways, I come across this grave I can open with an arrowhead I found earlier. In it is this book of curses that describes four masks of evil that, once put together, will awaken an evil. In it is one of the first of many keys to this mansion. I make my way down to a grimy kitchen and fall for the game's first scripted ambush. Trying to walk back up the stairs skips to a cutscene of something charging down the stairs. It's revealed to be a zombie, and Jill backs off slowly as it lumbers towards her. The camera brilliantly cuts from the zombie walking towards her face first back to the gameplay segment, forcing me to react quickly or suffer the consequences. Resident Evil does this all the time and it's great for keeping tensions high. You can't put the controller down during a cutscene because you never really know when it will cut back to gameplay. At the time, it didn't occur to me that I could have just run away from the thing, so I tried flanking it with the useless knife. Just like last time, that didn't work and I died horribly. I looked up some tips and many players said to learn the game on easy first and then jump to a harder difficulty. I ended up doing so and restarted the game on this more bearable difficulty like a normal human being would. After catching up to my previous save file, it wasn't long before I was packed with items, but as fans of the franchise know, inventory management is a big thing here. Mine was full and I couldn't figure out how to get rid of some items to pick up others. I thought I was missing something big, but I trudged on knowing this was an intentional game limitation. Eventually I fought my way to a safe room which solved that exact problem with the series staple, the item box. How could I forget? While still a creepy room, the music in the safe room does a great job of easing the tension a bit while still remaining anonymous. The pleasant guitar strings remind me of a town theme in some RPGs, but it's overlaid by some sinister instrument. A flute, maybe? That produces a moody echo to keep me from getting too comfortable. The item box actually provides some heals, and I save my game for the first time in a while. You save the game by using a typewriter, but can only save so many times due to the limited ink ribbon item. Since I'm playing on easy, I figured the game would give me a fair share of ribbons, and it did. After a bit of exploring, I learned more about the game's dynamic levels thanks to zombie dogs busting through some windows in an area I've already explored. The fact that new monsters can appear in almost any room at seemingly any time made the game consistently tense, especially because this can change on repeat playthroughs, as I learned in my second run. You never truly know what's going to be different. What quickly becomes a apparent is the mansion is a character in its own right and one that's much more interesting than any of the human ones. Every room is a puzzle. Some challenge you to fight or flee from meticulous play zombies while others are puzzles of the more traditional fare. Some rooms combine the two while a few serve as a form of respite and throw you a couple of items. That said, not all rooms are necessary. Some, like this lion puzzle room, provide nothing but some useful items. Those looking to speedrun the game or who are running low on inventory space are better off avoiding it. Part of mastering Resident Evil is knowing where the key items are and what order to get them in to get through the mansion with as little resistance as possible. After some more exploring and unlocking some doors with that key, I find my next hint, a note stating to use a dog whistle on the mansion's porch. Unsurprisingly, this sends a zombie dog after me, which I quickly dispose of to find the armor key, which unlocks another set of doors in the house. 
Well, sort of. This is actually a fake armor key, which I used to replace the real armor key to prevent being crushed by a trap. It's a neat little twist on the key gimmick, and one that encourages the player to double check everything they come across in this mansion. That many things might be more than they appear. Heading back to the safe room, I come across a faster, more dangerous zombie than I've seen before. I later learn this is called the Crimson Head, and they're new to the HD remaster. They appear if I leave a zombie body on the ground for a little while. I have to use kerosene and a lighter to burn these bodies, which I learned thanks to a document in one of the safe rooms. But this takes up two inventory spots, so I can either deal with that or I can avoid killing zombies altogether. If I'm able to get a critical hit, a zombie's head will explode, which also prevents crimson heads, but this is a rare chance while playing as Jill. Point is, these things suck, and from them on I seriously started to consider which zombies need to die and which I can just slip past. I find another room with a shotgun on the wall. Removing it traps me in there, so I replace it with a wooden shotgun found earlier, bringing the real one with me. Nice. This armor key alongside Jill's lockpick allow me to enter a new set of rooms, one of which I find Barry in. Jill. Barry, I didn't mean to get you that excited. Right. Anyway, you should read this. In another hilariously cheesy cutscene, Barry shows me the will of a researcher, Martin Crackhorn, who turned into a zombie. Considering it's a will, I assume this is written to his daughter or wife as he apologizes for never being able to see them again. But part of the letter is gone. What do you make of it? Well, I guess we were right about this mansion being quite unnatural. You have a way with understatements. Where's the part that's torn off? Well, my only guess is that it was the most important part, and somebody didn't want anyone to see it. Let's continue our investigation. Barry ditches me for no reason, and I bail from the room after struggling to solve its puzzle. I make my way into another room to find this random dude, Richard, poisoned by... A big snake. And it had to be poisonous. Poisonous? Richard, hold on! He asks for a serum, which, of course, is in the safe room on the other side of the mansion. A crimson head hits me a few times on the way, and then a few times after I grab the serum, so I go back to the safe room to heal, which I shortly learn was a big mistake. Since I took my sweet time getting back to Richard, he ends up dead. Now the serum wastes a spot in my inventory, and Jill has to deal with losing a close friend. This one is a strange moment in the game. It's Resident Evil's first timed event, which isn't explicitly noted to the player at all. But it's entirely possible to save Richard and get a powerful weapon, the assault shotgun, at a later time. I just had to continue on without it. I'd forgive you if you didn't rush to grab the serum and instead took your time assuming the scenario will remain the same. This happens in a lot of modern games, especially open world ones. It can take forever to get from point A to point B, with a ton of side activities to distract the player along the way. But considering most open world games don't have branching stories, the player can realistically take as long as they'd like to continue the plot. Nothing in Resident Evil hints at branching storylines, with the possible exception of there being two characters to choose from, but that doesn't necessarily mean two different stories. Many games allow you to choose different characters without it affecting the storylines. While yes, a player would generally rush to find an antidote when their friend is poisoned, those familiar with gaming might not assume this is necessary, especially considering there's no timer. I felt a sense of urgency for sure, but a few unexplored rooms distracted me, if only for a couple of minutes. Richard dies in five minutes, so those that I wasted turned out to be dire. It's also possible a player might not realize this is a fail state. Maybe they think Richard has to die and actually saving him in repeat playthroughs could be a nice surprise. Regardless, I like this event. It comes completely out of nowhere and can really mess with an ill-prepped player. Maybe they're low on health searching for green herbs. What if they're still not used to the combat? If they've avoided killing zombies, they'll have a much harder time getting the serum in back. The scene with Richard ramps up the tension and tests both a player's combat skills and their navigational skills. But you know what isn't a timed event? Your ability to click the subscribe button. So if you haven't, be sure to click that button down below, and don't forget the bell as well to get notifications for all of my new content. You do want my thoughts on the rest of the franchise, right? Now that you've subscribed, I make my way to the next set of rooms and come pretty close to death on the way. I don't have the damn lighter, so I can't do anything in this kitchen, so I get ambushed by a hidden zombie and bail back to the safe room. More zombies break in through cleared hallways as I rush back to the safe room. I actually screamed out loud at this. I struggle to open a first aid kit I found since it doesn't open at the latch for some reason. I'll get more into that later, but right now Jill is hurt and needs heals, and I don't have any. I do remember some herbs in a relatively safe space above the safe room and get her back to full health. This limited inventory space really adds to the survival aspect. I have to memorize where things are to come back to them later. Jill is not an RPG character that can just carry everything she comes across. 
She's in a desperate struggle to survive and that's communicated to the player through gameplay very well. I make my way to a puzzle room that requires me to push sets of armor back into place in a certain order. Games have puzzles like these all of the time so it wasn't too difficult to discover the pattern. This piece pushes that one back into place while this one triggers another one to come forward. It's typical stuff and it fits the theme in the mansion just fine. I'm rewarded with a jewelry box and provided a death mask. This probably goes in that underground grave from earlier, but that's just a guess. I open some more armor key doors and find another outdoor balcony. Out here is a dead stars soldier with a freaking grenade launcher. I'll take it. Past him are some heals and of course he comes alive to ambush me, but I'm not stupid. I'm not wasting the grenade launcher here. I boom the former man down with a shotgun and bail. I grab the lighter from the item box and find a music sheet in that kitchen. This should combine with a previous sheet I found in a room with a piano. The sheets combine, but for some reason I thought I needed a third sheet, so I leave it be and prep to handle the bug puzzle from before, bringing with new items this time. I'm dumb and eventually realize I could solve this entire puzzle with the items provided in the room. I need to put the bee hook by the fishing lures and the traditional bee specimen by the other specimens. This makes the bee come alive, so there's zombie bees too. I'm thankful the remake has auto aim though so I could kick this bee's ass and grab a wing crest on my way out, but not without a double tap for good measure. I make the effort to burn some bodies as I explore to make my life a little easier, making a mental note to stop killing so many of these zombies. I find a small bedroom with a rattling closet and open it to find another zombie. My shotgun blast wakes up another one on the ground, but I make quick work of them and find a housekeeper's diary. This details his taking care of some creature he describes as looking like a skinned gorilla. He talks about feeding it a pig, though it didn't just eat the thing, it tore the pig's legs off and literally pulled out its guts before eating. It's implied that this was a human turning into a zombie. Then he talks about an accident in the lab and everyone wearing haptic suits. The dogs that he takes care of are acting really weird and suddenly the housekeeper himself has swollen skin. The dogs have escaped and really this man's life is going to hell all around him. Long story short, his skin starts rotting, his words become short phrases, and he eats another houseworker. We can assume the room zombies are the housekeeper and his prey. I like these side stories a lot. They're not required to progress through the game, but they provide a lot of context regarding the mansion's downfall. It's through these journals I learned that this is the work of a human-created virus. They hint that the higher-ups knew what was happening, but did little to prevent its spread to mansion workers. The entire house was an experiment, and anyone unfortunate enough to be there was a test subject. Now I'm here to take care of the aftermath. Down the hall is a giant plant thing that appears invulnerable to bullets. I can spray some water on it, but nothing happens. I grab some herbs on the side and bail after wasting my last shotgun bullets. On the way back is a tiger that needs a blue gem. I end up having one and giving one to him rewards me with shotgun ammo and I'm on my way. Jill fully loaded. On this easy difficulty, Resident Evil doles out ammo at a good pace, which explains why I'm able to kill almost every zombie in my path even though I really shouldn't have. This does change in hard mode, but I'll cover that in my next video. The point is, my dumbass grabs a grenade launcher to fight the plant, passing directly over the item called chemical to use on plants in my item box. After wasting some grenades on the thing, I end up remembering the chemical and poison that thing to death. This rewards me with some more herbs and another mask. Good thinking by me. Only took a couple of hours longer than it should have. Of course, now that I've actually made some progress, these zombies that have been bashing at the window in the hallway actually break in and scare the living hell out of me. Of course, things in this mansion can't go too well. I'm lost now. Time for some backtracking to see if there's something I've missed. I never tried the front door, but that turns out to be a mistake. It's a good trick here by Capcom. I find a new room with colored paintings that correlate to a main painting at the end of the hallway. There are also some obnoxiously loud ravens in here. I have to adjust my volume every time these things make an appearance in the game. Setting these paintings to the right color opens a back way into the graveyard and provides me with a third mask. Hell yeah, just one more to go. I remember the music sheet and realized that when I combined the two earlier, the item was actually complete. So I head to the piano room and Jill actually starts playing the piece.
Good thing she can play piano, that's really convenient. This opens up a secret door with an emblem and a diary from one George Trevor. It seems important. This dude has been stuck at the mansion for 11 days. Allegedly, only him and one Sir Spencer are aware of the quote-unquote secret of this mansion. It's because of that that they may try to kill him, so it's time to escape, but we can assume he doesn't. He mentions that the mansion has secret hideaways, and he also mentions his family, Jessica and Lisa, quite often. They might already be dead and he's losing his memory. The writing is quite disjointed and then it ends. I then realize I need to replace that gold emblem I just found with a wooden one I found from before. I put the gold emblem back where the old one was, which turns the clock in the room into a puzzle. I quickly solve it and this gives me another key, the shield key. At this point, I've opened most doors in the mansion, so there's only a few doors this key can open. This, along with the map, ensure a constant sense of progress despite running through the same rooms over and over again, and knowing which doors are already open keep the pace moving along briskly. The mansion is a big place. Having the player memorize it all right away would have been asking too much. This map is a godsend, and I'm not even religious. I find my way back to that cobwebby door from before, which pits me against a massive snake that I can assume was the one that bit Richard. I screeched and used all of my incendiary grenades to try and kill it. I also find the final death mask in the corner, so I grab that and bail as I was running out of ammo. Apparently Jill was poisoned and passes out, but someone saves her and we wake up in the far safe room. Jill calls out for Barry, Barry? but no one's there. Creepy. I get the sense that everyone knows a bit more than Jill about what's going on here. Anyways, I say screw the snake and bring all four masks to the grave pit. A giant coffin falls and out comes a crimson head boss. The camera remains static with a wide view of the room making this boss fight really difficult. It's an interesting challenge considering most crimson head enemies have been in areas I'm familiar with so I can manipulate the situation. This one forces me to fight at an awkward angle and I only had pistol ammo to fight back. It killed me multiple times and this is the first real scenario where I've been punished for using most of my ammo. The pistol hardly stuns this dude and I need to angle and hit a ton of shots while also trying to avoid his quick attacks. This is difficult with the tank controls as I had no other guns to use on him since my shotgun was out of ammo. There is some ammo in the grave pit there but every time I try grabbing it he attacks me. So after a couple of deaths I end up backtracking throughout the mansion to see if I missed any ammo. I end up finding nothing after about a half hour of searching. So that's it. I need to grab the ammo in that pit. I let the creature grab me by the door so he stunned for a second and make my way over to the ammo first try. I blow him down and find a stone and metal object in his coffin. This is a well placed boss fight for a variety of reasons. It's the first time Resident Evil locks the player in a room with an enemy, but it does so with a familiar one, assuming this is a remake. The Crimson Head paces the tension up a bit, but not too much, especially considering the player may or may not have already fought the snake to death. There's no escaping, but at this point one should understand the game's movement enough to juke the guy. It showed that I needed to take more risks in combat, so I adjusted my playstyle after finally winning. As for that stone and metal object, I know of a few places this might fit. Naturally, I try this big set of doors in the main foyer, but I'm missing a second object to open them. One of the only things left is that snake, so I fight him till he escapes an event, beating him with my last bullet. Turns out there's nothing else in here but some shotgun shells, so it was a wasted effort. At least I got a trophy. After a lot more searching, I come across an outdoor area from earlier. Turns out this object can't open a door there and I find a ton of ammo and health for good measure. I leave through one door and find a linear pathway into the woods. There's a pretty neat memorization puzzle to solve that leads me to a graveyard, and I'm attacked by ravens as I find a gravestone puzzle. I obviously need the wind crest, which I already had on my person since it was similar to the stone and metal object. It was a lucky coincidence here. This gives me three more crests to insert in the opposite grave and I'm rewarded with a magnum revolver. Hell yeah. I also appreciate the placement of this puzzle because it forces the player to understand how examining an item works. Introducing a menu segment in a relatively calm area after a big fight is a good move. The path then takes me to a little hut towards the edge of the property. Here is a fresh fire in a safe room. It's honestly quite a vibe. In the back I find a crank and we hear the door open which is just the worst sound. Jill gets conked by some two-faced knockoff and wakes up a few feet away from the thing that just knocked her out. Why the hell did it knock me out just to leave me there and then chase me when I wake up? 
I take it out with the shotgun only for it to stand up again and again. God, I waste so much ammo on this playthrough in hindsight. Next to the typewriter is a journal with screwed up text that reads awful stuff like daddy attacked first or mommy isn't moving, then she's screaming. Yeah, it's safe to say Resident Evil is an appropriate title for this game. The game doesn't let me save since there's a psycho creature in there, so I yeet the hell out of there back to the original room, this time going through the other door. Here there's a strange blue herb and three dogs to take on. It's also here where I find out the Magnum is a beast since it kills each dog in one hit. The crank that I found earlier then lowers a dam into the next area and I sneak across to find an elevator. The elevator takes me to a new area with a waterfall, some more annoying crows, and another gate. I can't run through the waterfall so I head through that gate to be chased by goddamn ceiling snakes. This path leads to a side residence far from the mansion itself. Resident Evil loves to leave little hints to foreshadow what's next, and these blue herbs lead me to believe a ton of poisonous enemies are in my future as I've seen this discussed online before. A giant tentacle attacks me from a hole in the ground making me screech in real life. Fortunately, I can push this box over the hole to get around it. I walk through a hallway and overhear Barry yelling about destroying stars in the next room and something about his family. It's not necessary to destroy stars. What about my family? Too bad Jill completely believes that he's yelling at himself about nothing, even though he's a terrible liar. Oh, you heard. I think age is starting to take its toll. Talking to myself is becoming a bad habit. Talking to yourself? You alright? What's gotten into you? I'm getting you worried, aren't I? And then he bails again. I find a letter about some Plant 42, essentially a giant plant mutated by whatever virus is going around. That can probably explain what grabbed me earlier. There's a secret room behind some bookshelves. This is probably where the person talking to Barry ran off to. One boring box pushing segment later, I find myself in a flooded room fighting off sharks with that magnum. I admire Jill's ability to remain completely stoic during all of this. One room is full of what I can assume to be Plant 42 tentacles based on the document in there. That ain't it, chief. The next door is locked and the music starts really picking up which urges me to rush the hell out of there. Good thing I do because a giant shark tries eating me as I narrowly escape. I tase a zombie like a complete badass that somehow got in the berry room only to get pranked by a giant beehive hidden behind a map of the area. Something I love about this game so far is the variety of ways to ramp up the tension. While this initially feels like a simple zombie game, the last 30 minutes or so have introduced plant tentacles, a giant shark, surprise me with a big beehive, and let's not forget about that invincible monster hag. The first half of this quote unquote zombie game from 1996 has more scares than most modern horror titles. I can totally see why Resident Evil grew into the franchise it is today. Speaking of enemy variety, the next room also made me scream thanks to a spider dropping down and blocking my only exit. I probably could have fought it, but I was too shaken to do that. I just wanted to bail. I dodge around it till the door is clear and I get the hell out of there. I explore a bathroom and I find a key that will actually open up a door that's next to this area's safe room. And in there is a dude who hung himself. This game is relentless. He left a suicide note, and honestly, after reading it, I don't blame the man for ending it before being turned into a zombie. Imagine being trapped in that situation. Then I walk into this room's bathroom to hear what sounds like a rope tearing. Turns out that dude is still alive. He didn't even get to avoid being a zombie. What a fate, man. I grab a key from this bathroom and bail the hell out. This key is for a control room, which I'm pretty sure is in the flooded area with the sharks. This time, I wreck those MFs so I never have to face them again. The control room puts me on the same level as the massive shark, which is only a little scary. Turns out whoever was here before failed to drain the water. The shark picks up on me trying to do the same and smashes the glass to try and stop me. Emergency. Unknown source of pressure detected. Locking all doors to achieve maximum safety. I'm put in a timed puzzle, rushing to lower the pressure to fix the drain situation. Fortunately, a document in this room tells me exactly how to do that, so I finish up pretty quickly, and that shark is finished. Also, I finally figure out how to open that first aid kit. 
You have to examine it at the top, but not at the latch for some reason. I'm not sure why that is. Anyways, I make my way to that giant shark's carcass and try to grab an item only for it to flop up and knock that item over. To fight back, I push an electric console into the water and turn it on, frying that fool. The item turns out to be a key to another locked door in the residence which leads to the gallery. Based on all the lab equipment in here, this is probably where the T-Virus was developed. Creepy. I conveniently find some insecticide I know I can use against that beehive. There's also a keypad that resembles these lamps from back in the spider room. I show these bees what's up to find another key which opens another door within the gallery. How did anyone get around this place? Did they just have dozens of copies of these keys to hand out? Anyways, this room contains more plant roots which show the thing has really spread throughout the mansion. I've seen it in like five places now. There's also a recipe for something called V-Jolt, a chemical that should destroy the plant once I'm to come across it. But before that, it's time to clear out the spider room. I'm not taking any chances. It's time to blow these MFs up with a nade launcher. I do so, and then it's death liquid poisons me, which is just fantastic. This room has three colored lamps with a different type of eye under each. These are similar to the eyes on that keypad, so I take a screenshot of each thanks to the PlayStation 4 screenshot function. I also find a red book that definitely fits in that bookshelf from earlier. Upstairs is a strangely important pool table that I also take a screenshot of. Resident Evil places too much emphasis on these things for them not to be important. Another case of it respecting my time like with the map. There's also a spider on the right that I notice way too late, but it actually never ends up attacking me, so I leave him be. I place the red book alongside the rest and must rearrange them into a portrait of a naked lady lying down. I tried googling to find some sort of significance to this image, but I didn't find anything. Anyways, I order them properly and a secret door appears behind the other bookshelf. It seems important and that it will progress the plot, so I bail out to check out the keypad first. As I mentioned earlier, the keypad has eyes that correlate with the lamps from the spider room. Each color correlates to the numbered pool ball of the same tint. For example, the green pool ball is 6, so I need to press 6 on the green keypad. Here there's containers and colors and things that directly relate to a document that describes the Plant 42 monster. That document provides a list of colors to mix that result in the V-Jolt formula that should kill the plant. I struggle with mixing these colors for a bit and decide to bail and check out that other door anyways, thinking I might not have everything to make the V-Jolt. If you've played this game already, you know this was a big mistake on my part considering the next room has that massive plant monster in it. The door behind me isn't working, so I'm forced to juke past the thing in some sort of escape, unequipping my weapon to run faster. It's with this I go back to the chem room to try and mix things once again. Properly mixing the V-Jolt takes longer than I'd like to admit, but after infecting Jill with some undoubtedly permanent brain damage from the gas, I finally get it done. It's time to bust a plant. I try initially going through the room I went through earlier, but the book is removed and that door is just gone. I wouldn't be surprised if Barry's shady ass removed it to try and get me trapped in there. Anyways, I already unlocked another path, and it's here I realize I actually have no idea how to use the V-Jolt. I try activating it at all these different angles as the plant pisses out poisonous pus onto Jill. None of that works, so I leave the room to roam around a bit, and looking at the map, I actually remember the tentacles by the shark area. So I make my way all the way back there, and sure enough, that's how I actually use the V-Jolt. I should really be writing these locations down. I'm hoping it actually kills the thing, but I'm doubtful. I'm also a little surprised there are no pickups in this room. I get back to the plant and find that it actually is dead. Well, kind of. It grabs Jill in a surprise attack right as Barry runs through yelling, What the hell is this thing? Despite having a freaking flamethrower in his hands, which really makes me think he was prepared for this or something, Barry roasts the thing. Ah! and Jill and him exchange some more awkward dialogue, aka Barry gaslights the hell out of her in so many cringeworthy ways. Something about that mansion still bothers me, but I think I'll stay here a little longer. We should split up again and investigate. All right. 
I'm not playing this game for its character interactions and development, that's for sure. I learn later I can actually fight Plant 42 with guns, but I appreciate the alternative method with the V-Jolt. It's great that the game can cater to more analytical players or those who just want to fight everything. Both options are a challenge, with the former requiring no small amount of backtracking to commit to. On the way out, I run into Toolbag Wesker, who for some reason apologizes for nothing. So you're safe. That's what I was going to say. I apologize. It was all I could do to protect myself against those strange creatures. I understand. And then Jill understands and accepts this apology of nothing. Anyway, it's good that you're safe. Did you notice? Barry, it sounded a little flaky. Now that you mention it, yeah. I'll keep a close eye. Maybe it's quite natural under these circumstances. It's not really our standard operation. Jill, our first priority is to get out of here. I agree. These two clearly know something I don't. Wesker then calls Barry flaky in his first set of words that actually make sense before telling Jill to clear the rest of the mansion. Then he flakes. This is the worst squad I've ever seen in anything ever, just ever at all. Why separate when stranded in a mansion like this? I find Barry left me some genuinely useful items back at the mansion entrance though. What a great guy. Or at least I'd think that if he wasn't the flakiest MF on the planet. He does give me acid grenades though and those sound awesome. I'm about halfway through the game and it has enthralled me more than most survival horror games I've played. Many titles like Outlast 2 or Blair Witch feel too gimmicky at the halfway point. There's little to surprise me in those games partly because there's nothing to fight back with. When running away from everything I see, encounters are only scary for so long. With Resident Evil I actually have to fight these terrifying things and the odds are stacked against me. Poor resource management or missing a shot can be my downfall. That's not to mention there's a ton of intrigue and mystery surrounding each room in the mansion, and I appreciate the game's slower pace so far as it allows me to explore everything as I see fit, learning to avoid or kill zombies along the way. I walk through that other door to find a star's radio on the ground. What's a star's radio doing here? Let's hope the thing still works. Inconsequential for now, but I take the stone object as I leave. You know, you gotta keep that thing on ya. Suddenly, a cutscene breaks my flow, showing a first-person view of some monster charging directly through the path in which I just came. It then breaks through the door in which I have the actual item required to open, which makes me feel pretty useless in comparison. The game cuts back to me being chased by a giant lizard, and I panic trying to open the closest door in a futile escape attempt. The thing whacks Jill with a crazy aerial attack before I'm ambushed by another one on the way to the safe room. Capcom totally knew players would book it right there and made the deliberate effort to screw them over on a first playthrough. It almost worked on me, but I was able to escape just in time. I'm halfway through and tensions are as high as ever. I make an emergency save and heal pit stop before bailing up the stairs to get a good angle on this monster. <laughs> After a tough encounter with the shotgun and grenade launcher, I retreat to another room to be faced with yet another puzzle. This is a pretty simple one that asks me to push a statue through some closing walls to open the next door. So far, Resident Evil has had a decent balance of item-based puzzles and one I can solve without too much thought. Considering everything I've just been through, this basic puzzle is a nice breather before what comes next. The puzzle leads to a pit with a golden emblem before I discover a big grave covered by a notebook. Opening it tells the story of a desperate attempt at escape by the mansion's designer George Trevor. Turns out this gravestone right here is his, and he came across the thing while alive. Trevor's grim last words are praying for his family's safety who are somehow involved in all of this. What he apparently missed is that this gravestone covers a ladder into an underground tunnel. Resident Evil plays more of its camera tricks here by jumping to a giant spider in this claustrophobic room. I take no chances and explode the thing with my grenade launcher. I clear the rest of the room with my shotgun and find a map. Turns out I'm in the mansion's basement again. A couple of zombies and a power generator later, I loop back around to the kitchen. Now that the power's back, the elevator is working and I take it to a hidden area 
area on the second floor. There's a few collectibles and a battery, which I instantly realize belongs back in the mansion courtyard. For now though, it's time to unlock all the doors I missed. A rather tedious puzzle has me gathering gems from two mounted animals, but more interesting is the discovery that the star's crash was all planned. I find this out thanks to a document sent to the mansion's chief of security. Apparently the group was meant to gather star's combat data by having us fight something called the BOW. It then mentions a tyrant before instructing the chief to dispose of all test evidence in a laboratory, as well as stay our deaths as an accident. It's signed by one Umbrella Headquarters, which I already know from Resident Evil 4 to be the main antagonist group of the franchise. The game has hinted at a setup various times already, so this didn't come as too much of a surprise. What I do wonder though is how much Barry and that tool are involved. Some exploring leads me to a gallery next to the main foyer. In here are some preserved organs for some reason, as well as a handwritten note that describes some room hidden behind a painting. Mysterious. Down the hall is a mirrored room that plays the camera against me and another zombie. A neat gimmick that's only used once, as far as I remember. I like that even this far in the game, Resident Evil makes each zombie encounter a deliberate one. This isn't Left 4 Dead where I just blow through monsters left and right with no thought about it. Here each fight is a thought provoking decision. I can spend my ammo or leave the creature be, but it will remain a threat the rest of the game if I do so. But we'll have to wait for the next video to go more into that. If you couldn't tell so far, I'm absolutely loving my time with this game. The story is cheesy and frustrating from a cutscene perspective, but collectibles and other hints do a fantastic job building the game's world. Resident Evil also scares me more than Outlast or other more modern titles, which is a testament to the game's timeless design and that damn camera angle. Anyways, thanks for watching this far in. Let me know your memories of the game in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe and click that bell icon to be instantly notified for part two of this series. I'll see you guys in the next one. Next one.